All right, all right. A new homeowner's lawnmower had broken down, and he had been working fruitlessly for two hours trying to get it back to go. All of a sudden, his neighbor showed up there to help him with a big armful of tools. His neighbor said, can I help you? And within 20 minutes, his neighbor had the mower running beautifully. The now happy new neighbor whose lawnmower had been broken down, he said, thanks a million. And by the way, what do you make with such nice tools? And the neighbor said, well, mostly friends, mostly friends. Someone once defined a friend this way. He said, a friend is someone who walks in when all the world has walked out. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 24, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I want to invite you this morning to turn with me to John chapter number 15. I believe that friend who sticks closer than a brother, that friend who loves at all times, is the Lord Jesus Christ. I invite you to turn with me to John chapter 15. And if you don't have a copy of God's Word, feel free to follow along on the screen. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for the privilege of being able to assemble today to worship and honor you. God, I pray now at this time that you would open all of our hearts that we might receive your living word. Father, I pray for that one here today that's never trusted you, your son, as their Savior. I pray right now as I am praying that the Holy Spirit will begin to convict their heart and bring them to an awareness of their need of salvation. God, I pray for that one who is saved today that's in our midst who is not where they need to be with you. God, I pray that in love that you would draw them back into a close fellowship with you. Father, I pray that you would cleanse me of any wicked way, any wicked deed, any wicked thought. And God, I yield myself to you as your messenger. Now, God, speak to your people in and through me. And may Jesus be honored and uplifted. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. John chapter 15, verse 13, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known unto you. I'm preaching on this thought this morning, our friendship with Christ. Our friendship with Jesus Christ. In this chapter, in describing His union between He and His disciples, the Lord Jesus mentions several components about His friendship with his disciples. I believe every single one of you would agree with me this morning that every person on planet earth needs a friend. And I'm here to tell you there's no greater friend than a person can have than the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the greatest friendship that you can enter into in this life. The term friend was used by Jesus three times in the verses that we have just read. The term friend, as Jesus uses it here, is a person. 
you know well, a person you regard with affection and trust, a friend who is intimate and close to you. I think each of you would agree with me that a friendship is one of the most greatest assets that you can have in this walk of life. I believe also that a friendship involves a reciprocal relationship. It's not a one-sided affair. It takes two people who care for each other. So my question is, what is the basis of our friendship with Jesus Christ? What does it mean to be one of the friends of Jesus? Well, I want to mention to you this morning several wonderful components about our friendship with Christ so that you can know what it means to be a friend to Jesus. Number one this morning, the first wonderful component that Jesus enlightens us about concerning our friendship with Him is love. In verse 13, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus here is telling us that at the very basis, at the very core, the very bond of our friendship with him is a great love. It's a love without limits. It's a love without conditions. It's a love without boundaries. Someone once tried to describe the love of God in this way. He said, if you was to fly four angels from the throne of God over the sea of God's love to try to find its limits, they would fly and they would fly and they would fly again and again and return back after a thousand years to report that there is no limits, there's no border, there's no shore to God's unconditional love. In Ephesians chapter number 3, verses 17 through 19, the Apostle Paul wrote to the believers at Ephesus, and he prayed for them that they would comprehend with all the saints what is the length and what is the width and what is the depth and the height to know the love of Jesus Christ. When I think about the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, I think about John 3.16. For God so loved the world. That's the breadth of God's love. That he gave his only begotten son. That is the length that God went to show his love to you and to me. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the depth of God's love. It reaches down to the gullies and ditches of humanity and rescues you and me and transforms us into a child of God. That whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the height of God's love. You see, God's love reaches down to us at our lowest point and it elevates us up to the highest point that humanity could ever go. And that is to be a child of the living God. Oh, our friendship with Christ is based upon love, a great love to be exact. But John goes on to tell in this verse that not only our friendship is based on a great love, but a sacrificial love. John here records the words of Jesus, and he speaks of the greatest demonstration of a friendship is one being willing to sacrifice their life for a friend. When we think about the Lord Jesus and our friendship with Him, His life was voluntarily and selflessly given, sacrificed for His friends. But not only was His life sacrificed and voluntarily, selfishly, uh, selflessly given for His friends, but His life was given for the whole world, all the world. 
And not only was his life given for his friends and the whole world, but do you realize that his life was laid down, given for even his very own enemies? I want to read to you from Romans chapter number 5 about that. Beginning in verse number 6, the Bible says, For when we were still without strength, In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Folks, I want to tell you, God the Father, His love is the foundation for our friendship with Christ. The love of God the Son is the basis of this love relationship. And the greatest demonstration, the perfect picture of this love is seen for you and me when we look back 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed by the hands of wicked men. He was falsely tried. And then after that, he was led outside of Jerusalem up upon Calvary's hill and there he bled and he died for each and every one of us and as he stretched out his arms on the cross it was as if to say I love you this much oh I love the song oh the love that drew salvation's plan oh the grace that brought him down to man oh the mighty gulf that God did span there at Calvary. Oh, my friend, our friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we must realize that there is that component of love that holds us together with Him. I read about on August the 16th, 1987, the Northwest Airlines Flight 225 crashed just after taking off from the Detroit airport killing 155 people. There was only one survivor that day, a four-year-old little girl by the name of Cecilia. When the rescuers found Cecilia, they could not believe that she survived. How did she survive the impact? How did she survive the fire? How did she survive all of the crash when everyone else died? They were able to talk to Cecilia and to examine the situation. And they soon discovered that apparently when the plane started to crash, that her mother unbuckled, wrapped herself completely around that four-year-old little girl and held on to her and did not let her go throughout the crash. In like manner, folks, I want to tell you, the fiery wrath of God's anger for sin against sinners, against you and I, was poured out by God the Father on God the Son there at the cross. And when you and I run to the Lord Jesus Christ, because He loves us, He took all of our sin, He took all of our judgment, and He bore that Himself so that you and I would be protected from the wrath of God for all eternity. Listen, our friendship with Christ begins with love. Our friendship with Christ continues with love. And our friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ will carry on and continue throughout all eternity because of love. You know, I love to read uh, the, the 13th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, my Aunt Jane that passed away, she had written on a sheet of paper in her Bible that her favorite chapter 
was 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. And she had learned that in the fourth grade when she was a little girl. And she wanted that put on the bulletin at her funeral. And as I read that chapter, you get down to the very end. And the Paul says that there's three things that are great. There's faith, there's hope, and there's love. But Paul said the greatest of these is love. Do you know why that love is the greatest? Because love will last for all eternity. Love will last for all eternity. So I want to ask you this morning, are you a friend of Jesus? Have you accepted and received his free gift of love in your heart? Well, we see this component of love. But number two, in our friendship with Christ, there is another component, and that is obedience. Obedience. Look with me at verse number 14 of our text. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Notice that, whatever I command you. Here we see that not only our friendship with Christ is made up by love, but it's made up by obedience as well. And specifically, obedience to the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ. This here lets us know that if we are friends of Jesus, then we're going to be submitted to the Lord Jesus. We're going to live a life that's surrendered to Him, a life that allows Him to be the authority in our life, the, a life that allows Him to be the leader and the guide of our lives, Full, fully accepting His commandments commands day in and day out as we walk through this world. And then as I think about obedience, you know, a friend of Jesus desires to please Jesus, doesn't he or she? And the way that you and I please the Lord Jesus Christ is by lovingly and joyfully obeying all of his commandments. Now, in order to obey the commands of Jesus, I think you would agree with me, you've got to know what they are. You've got to know what they are. And to know what they are, you've got to read His Word and hear what He has to say. And then after you read His Word and hear what He says, then you apply it to your life. Apply it to what you think. Apply it to how you feel. Apply it to how you perceive things. Apply it to what you say. Apply it to what you do. So here, obedience is key in our relationship with Christ. Obedience to the commands of Christ. But notice something else about that statement. Jesus here is saying great, that you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. I believe he is saying, folks, that obedience is a clear indication that we are his friends. Now, folks, we don't enter into our friendship with Christ on the basis of obedience. We enter into our friendship with Christ on the basis of trusting Him and accepting Him as our personal Lord and Savior. But the proof of that, the proof that we're really a child of God, the proof that we're really a friend of Jesus, the proof that we daily walk with the Lord Jesus is that you and I will be obedient to His commandments. You know, I think about where Jesus said in Luke chapter number 6, verse 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? The same question could be said this morning. Why does people call him friend when they do not obey him? Listen, folks. The first question that a child of God should ask right after receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior is just like the question the Apostle Paul asked. In Acts chapter 9, verse number 6, right after Paul trusted Christ as his Savior, immediately he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? 
And folks, that's the whole life of a Christian. That should be characterized by the whole life of a friend of Jesus, obeying him, following him, submitted to him, saying, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. Each and every morning when we get up out of bed, our constant question to Jesus should be, Jesus, what do you want me to do today? Jesus, where do you want me to go today? Jesus, what do you want me to say for you today? You know, as I think about that, it would be a serious behavioral problem on the part of a soldier if he chose to obey certain commands of his superior officer while discarding and ignoring the others. That officer may say something like, I don't like that, or I will reject that and just obey the other. But it would be a serious offense, wouldn't it? And I believe it would be a serious offense if a druggist was to receive a prescription from a well-equipped uh, doctor and after fully looking over the prescription was to say back to the physician and back to the patient, well, here are some of the elements I will put into the prescription, some of them, but I'll discard the other at my own discretion. Even greater, folks, and more significantly, it is an offense and a serious problem for an individual to say, I'm a friend of Jesus and to only obey him when they want to. Oh, is there proof from my life? Is there proof from your life that we are truly friends of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there proof from our words that we speak from the lips of our mouth that we are a friend of Jesus? Is there proof from the life that we live that we are a friend of Jesus? Is there proof from the attitude that we display that we are friends to Jesus? Is there proof from our service to God that we are really friends of the Lord Jesus Christ? There is the component of love. There's the component of obedience. But thirdly, Jesus points out to us that there is a third component to our friendship with Christ, and that is the component of knowledge. The component of knowledge. Look at verse 15 of our text again. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Now, Jesus here is saying that we, you and I who are his disciples, you and I who are believers, you and I who are his friends, let me let you in on something. We're in the know. We are in the know. You see, during this culture, during this time, the slave, the servant, did not have a close relationship with their master as friends would. However, you and I are special to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been elevated to a special position in our union with Him. As disciples of Christ, we are not only servants of the Most High God, but we are friends to the Lord Jesus Christ. George W. Truett, that wonderful pastor who served for many years at the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, once said, The highest possible honor in earth or heaven is to be called truly the friend of Jesus. Wouldn't you agree with that? Oh, it's wonderful for so-and-so down the street to call me their friend. I think it would be even wonderful for some famous person or some leader to call me their friend. But I may never have the privilege of some of those acquaintances but I tell you there is an acquaintance that you and I can know 
And it is the greatest privilege in all the world, and that is to be a friend, to be called the friend of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're in the know. We're in the know because we're his friends. And we are in the know, catch this, about the Father. Uh, Jesus here is talking about the difference between the slave and the friend. You see, a slave does what he or she is told to do without understanding the mind or the business of the master. But since you and I are friends, since we have accepted Christ as our Savior and He has accepted us, we are in the know. As a matter of fact, look at this. Jesus says the two words there in the beginning in verse number 15, no longer. This phrase is an indication, a change, a transition in the plan of God In 1 Peter chapter number 1, verses 10 through 12, the Apostle Peter tells us that the Old Testament prophets and the Old Testament people, they didn't fully understand the full picture of God's plan, even though they ministered about it, even though they prophesied about it, even though they wrote about it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They didn't understand all of it because God had not revealed the fullness of His will at that point. But now that Jesus has come into the world and Jesus has paid for our sins and Jesus has revealed the full plan of the Father, you and I are in the full know about God's will for all humanity. Jesus reveals in His Word and by the Holy Spirit who God is. Jesus reveals through the Holy Spirit and His Word what God desires. Jesus reveals through the Word and by the Holy Spirit what God is doing in the world right now. Through the Word and the Holy Spirit, Jesus reveals what we are to be doing in the world right now. And catch this, He also reveals through His Word what God is yet to do in the future. You know, as I think about a friend and being in the know on intimate, precious terms with the Lord, do you know there was a man in the Old Testament by the name of Abraham. And Abraham in both the Old Testament and the New Testament is called the friend of God. The friend of God. In Genesis chapter number 18, there's some visitors that come by to see Abraham one day. They spend some time there with Abraham. Abraham serves them a meal. If you find out... In that chapter, one of those visitors was a pre-incarnate, the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. And as they were talking, God said to Abraham, the Lord said to Abraham, Abraham, shall I withhold from you what I'm about to do? Shall I withhold from you my will? What was it that God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter 19. Why did God need to reveal that to Abraham? You see, Abraham had a nephew down in Sodom that he dearly loved by the name of Lot. And since God revealed that to Abraham, Abraham began to pray and to intercede to God on behalf of Lot and the people of Sodom. And eventually, Abraham was able to pray. And God sent some servants down there, some angelic servants, and delivered Lot out of that terrible place called Sodom. You see, folks, when a child of God walks with Jesus, when a child of God stays in the words of Jesus, when a child of God has fellowship with Jesus, You and I in this world, in this society of confusion, we can live with confidence and peace and assurance because we know God, we know His peace, and we have Him as our guide through this world. Humanity today, 
you know as well as I do, lives in a constant state of deception and denial when it comes to spiritual and eternal matters. Men and women and boys and girls, each and every day they are trying to live their lives in this dark world by fate and chance. However, folks, you and I are Christ friends. We have light in our dwelling. We have light in our hearts because of the knowledge of Christ and because of God's divine revelation that illuminates our hearts and minds in this world. Oh, I love that, don't you? Are you a friend to Jesus is Jesus your friend? Have you trusted Him as your Lord and Savior? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? I'm here to tell you there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that He is not near us. No, not one, no, not one, and no night so dark that his love can't cheer us. No, not one. If you've received him as your friend, then you can sing what a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear, what a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Have you trials and temptations cumbered with a load of care? Do not ever be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I want to ask you this morning, do you have a friendship with Christ? Have you trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior? Here in a moment, we're going to stand to our feet. And if you've never given your heart to Jesus, if you don't have a relationship, a true relationship with Jesus, I want to invite you to come today and I want to show you how you can be saved and receive Jesus as your dearest friend. Would there be a Christian here today? And you've trusted Christ as your Savior, but you're walking at a distance from Jesus you're not as close to Him as you once was. You and Him are apart somewhat from each other. I want to invite you to come today.